Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, babies in their diapers, welcome to the Tiberia Show with your host, Tiberius Boy! That's me, Tiberius! Today, we're going to talk about some very awesome stuff. We have a video about making gumballs, a book about smashing the history of the revolution, and we have a totally awesome guest. Today, we have the one, the only, the amazing Ted Slauson. Ted is a mathematics assessment specialist and is famous for being an expert on the price is right. And thank you for having me on your show. No problem. And today, we're going to start off with a video game of the week, and this is going to be a ball. And now it's time for the video game of the week. Today's video game is Gumball Factory Tycoon. This game is made by Rep Rep. Because it's on Roblox, you are able to play it on PC, Mac, Xbox, and even your cell phone. And it is free. You may remember Rep Rep from the other games, Rope People, Punching Mania, and Rape My Booth. Hmm. So first off, you appear at a factory with a super large gumball tower in front of you. Some yellow gumballs come out and you go to the down the ramp and stops the factory door. You have to go open it up. Then when it fills in the factory, you have to click each one to make them turn into gum sticks. Then the sticks go down a ramp and get sold for money. You do it again and again until you can upgrade to get additional flavors. You can unlock th stuff like lemon, blueberry, kiwi, and even cherry flavors. After a while, when you have more money, you can get an auto clicker that will save you the time from doing it and one that will hold the door open for longer. This allows you to explore. There is an obby that gives you double money after you complete it. You know I love a good obby. I got my dad to try and he was very bad at the obby, but very good in getting the math of the game to work in his favor. After 30 minutes, he was already past me. Mm. I give Build a Gumball Factory Tycoon 8 out of 10 stars because even though it was a lot of fun at first, I did not like having to push a button for each gumball. It was fun to get my dad to try it until he was beating me. He unlocked a gumball tree that would drop additional bonuses. Most kids that like tycoons would enjoy this game. And now it's time for the book of the week, History Smashes the American Revolution. This is written by Kate Messner. Let me to the back of the book. In fact, Ted, would you like to do the honors? Sure. Myths, lies, secrets. Smash the stories behind famous moments in history and expose the hidden truth. On April 18th, 1775, Paul Revere rode through Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts, shouting, the British are coming, right? Wrong. Paul Revere made it to Lexington, but before he got to Concord, he was captured. Discover the nonfiction series that smashes everything you thought you knew about history. Hmm. Well, this is an app book that's worth four points. It's rated for seventh grade and fourth month. This is a great series about myths and lies about history. So this book is pretty cool. They take a subject and follow it through history and find out all the misconceptions that people used to think about it. This one is about the American Revolution. So the book starts off with the fact that the reason that the war started was because of all the new acts or laws that the British government was imposing on the streets, not allowing them to purchase supplies by anyone but England. If you wanted to complain, that would be treason, so people used fake names. John Adams would use the name Humphrey Plow Plowjogger and would make misspellings on purpose so that it would look like he's an uneducated farmer. The book also talks about the fact that Molly Pitcher was a woman that took up her husband's cannon and kept fighting after he was killed. But the real story is a lot of men women did that, and they were called Pitcher since they were bringing water and supplies for the troops. Deborah Sampson even dressed like a man so she could fight with everyone else. Later, when it was found that she was a woman, she was honorably discharged. I give History Smashers the American Revolution 9 out of 10 stars because it was a riveting story and I really liked learning that Samuel Prescott was the one that finished the mission of warning about the British, but Paul Revere was easier to rhyme in the poem, even though he got caught and did not finish.
Over 40 years, Playhouse Central Florida has provided education, independent life skills, and job training to thousands of Central Floridians who live with blindness or any degree of vision loss. Whether it's picking out clothes in the morning or just moving around your community and serving Orange, Seminole, and Osceola counties, contact Playhouse Central Florida at 407 898 2483 or visit them online at lighthousecfl.org. And now it's time for an interview of an interesting person. Today's guest is going to be so much fun. Today we have the one, the only, the amazing Ted Slauson. Ted is a mathematics assessment specialist and is famous for being the source of the only perfect score on The Price is Right. So first off, how are you enjoying being on the show? I'm enjoying it a lot. Thank you so much for having me again. No problem. So you are listed as a mathematics assessment specialist. Can you explain to my listeners exactly what that means? I can. That What that means is that when you take a standardized math test, like at the end of the year, you might take one uh, depending on what state you're in, or you might take the SAT when you're getting ready for college. I work on math test questions that go on those tests or those types of tests. And it basically involves reading what we get from item writers and editing and making them clear, making sure that students won't get confused by what they're reading or asked, being asked to do. And then we also then take those questions and build different test forms that get administered to students. Okay. So how did you get interested in being an assessment specialist? I actually was uh, going back to school in the early 2000s, and I was doing a computer programming um some pr computer programming coursework and I got a temporary job where you score student responses to some of the open-ended questions and I started doing that first and after about a year and a half or so of doing that I saw a posting for an actual job where it was on this side of what I do now and that's kind of how I got into it. Wow so how long have you been doing this? Um, as of six days ago, it has been 17 years. Wow. Actually, no, that's wrong. As of six days ago, it's been 19 years. Ah, cool. Like a math person would be able to subtract better than that. As on you? seven days ago, I just started middle school, so. Awesome. <laughs> so how do you know that this is a go-to job for you? Um, because I had worked as a teacher for 13 years, and so I'm already, you know, pretty much familiar with all levels of math up through calculus, and um, it just was a nice transition and just enjoyable work. You get more, um, your, your pay is not based on how many years you've actually done the job, but more on the quality of your work, so you're, you're more able to get, um, kind of advanced on the salary if you do a good job. Okay. So how does being a mathematics assessment specialist make the world a better place? I would say because, uh, you know, we want people to be able to, in certain jobs and, and going to college, we want to make sure they know how to do uh, certain math skills or how to solve problems. And so my work helps determine if people can solve problems or just do some basic math. Okay. Does it take a lot of formal training to become an SMS specialist? Um, not really. It was mostly informal on the job training. Um, one thing that worked at my first job was we did a lot of uh, group editing where we would take a set of items and the entire team would kind of work on them together and come up with <clears throat> ways to improve the wording to make them clearer. Okay. So is this like the FCAT or the CTP slash child torture program? I like that acronym. <laughs> I actually did work on the FCAT for Florida for about five and a half years. Uh, so yeah, those kinds of tests. Well, do you work on the CTP? Excuse me. Uh, no, I do not. I actually work on the Maryland program at the moment. Okay. So what is the best part about doing this type of work? Um... I think because you get to work with others and uh, the, the best part, the part I like the most is the actual form building process. What is the one thing that when you started to work in this field that you did not expect? I think that you have to have kind of a thick skin because you're going to be getting feedback from lots of different people, including your client. And you have to be able to take the feedback and learn from it. 
Um, you know, you might feel like you're an expert going in, but there are definitely a lot of things you learn um, about assessment in general. And what you really kind of learn as if you're a former teacher, which most of us are, is that the tests you wrote for your students may not have been the greatest tests in the world. You might have given them things that were confusing or, you know, could have been improved upon or may even had some bias or sensitivity mm -hmm. issues. So what is the hardest part about being a mathematics assessment specialist? Hardest part? I think when you have a, kind of a lot of competing deadlines going on at the same time and you're trying to make sure you get everything done on schedule, uh, that tends to be the most difficult. Okay. What have you learned about yourself while doing this type of work? Uh, I think what I've learned most is that I have kind of learned how to listen to committees when we take items to committee for review and listen to their feedback and concerns and then uh, come up with some kind of on-the-spot edits in a lot of cases to address their concerns. Okay. What advice would you give to my listeners if they wanted to grow up and be a mathematics assessment specialist? Well, definitely you want to be getting a degree in probably a content area like math or if you wanted to do like a science, if you want to be a science assessment specialist or social studies or language arts, uh, you'll want to get a degree in one of those areas and probably get some teaching experience under your belt as well. Those are usually the, the things they look for okay. uh, for the different companies who hire. Now, my dad told me that you are famous for memorizing all the prices on the game show, The Price is Right. Wow, that's a lot of prices. How did you do it? Um, well, in the early days, I used paper and pencil, and this was even before I had a computer. Once I had a computer, I started keeping kind of a database or an Excel spreadsheet with the different prizes and, and prices, uh, descriptions and things like that. And it was just um, <clears throat> going through the list and just trying to memorize. And as it got uh, later into the pro process around the early 2000s, I figured out a way to actually take pictures from the show and add those to my database so that when I was quizzing myself, I could see a picture of the prize or the product that I was supposed to price. Mm -hmm. And that made a dramatic improvement in my ability to remember the prices. Okay. So how long did it take to learn all those prices? Um, it depended on the season. As they got later in the run, um, they probably had more and more prizes that I had to memorize. Uh, they didn't repeat things as much. I would usually probably practice uh, memorizing around four to six weeks before I would go to a taping to try to get as much um, time as possible to get things memorized. Okay. So what is the best part about being able to be a contestant on The Price is Right? Oh, wow. Well, it took me 24 times going to the show, so uh, finally hearing my name was probably the best part about being a contestant because um, I didn't win a whole lot, but... Um, it was kind of a relief being able to finally get down there and use what I had been practicing to win something. Okay. Now, my dad said that you wanted a kiss from Holly, one of the prettiest ladies on the show. Did you ever get your kiss? I did. She happened to be modeling the prizes in the game that I played, and I had a shirt that said, I'm here to kiss Holly. So when she saw my shirt, um, she kind of walked out, and we met on stage. and. Huh? First, we kind of just hugged, and then she gave me a kiss on the lips. And at the end of the show, she actually gave me an autographed picture of herself, wow. which I still have. Do you still watch The Price is Right? Um, almost never. I watched, I did a 50th anniversary special, I think, and I watched that. But um, no, I don't watch it hardly ever anymore. Okay. One day, I might be a game show host. Would you go back on as a contestant if it was allowed? Um, I probably would. I would have to do some, um, if we're talking about prices, right, I assume we are. Um, it would depend on just being able, if I had the time to watch the show and kind of keep records like I used to do. Okay. Did being a mathematics expert help you become a prices right expert? Um, I think it helped because, you know, I, I can, I'm probably more able than most people to do like adding and subtracting and things like that in my head. And so I think that helps um, with some of the games and just some of the memorization as well. 
Okay, I see that you have been interviewed by lots of people about your skills. What is that one question that people ask you way too many times? Hmm. You know, I'm not really sure if it's a question about my skills. Um, I guess a lot of people want to know if I have, like, an eidetic memory, and I'm, I'm really not sure if I do. I think having the pictures in my database... Um, did help and so I was able to start recognizing things on site I wouldn't have to listen to descriptions so maybe that's the one question <clears throat> mm -hmm. what is that one question that you wish that they would ask you um, a lot of people I guess they never really ask how I came to like really get some of the prices of some of the prizes on the show that never were really revealed and so that's kind of a little secret, I guess, that I have about how I was able to do what I did. So how did you get the prices? Well, there was a showcase in the early 80s. Um, I was watching one day. I was home by myself. And <clears throat> I knew the prices of all of the prizes in the showcase except one. And I guessed on that price it was carpeting. And I guess the carpeting was $20 per square yard. And when they revealed the showcase prices, I was on the nose. And that was 1984, I think. And it took me about six years to come to the realization that whenever I knew all but one of the prices in the showcase, I could figure out that last price by just subtracting everything from the total. Yes. And once I started doing that and actually tracking showcases, I hadn't really ever done that. I was able to start backwards engineering prices for trailers and boats and things that were only ever really shown in the showcases. Mm -hmm. So what was the craziest thing that has happened while you were doing your job? Um, craziest thing. We've had... Um, I'm trying to think of that. I think the craziest thing, I had to do a... I had to run a bias committee one time, and bias... Basically, the committee is just looking for things that might cause one group of students to do well on the question and other students might not do as well. Um, so a quick example is like if you wrote a question about a football team and you use terminology that's only going to be familiar to football people who know football, like they rushed the ball 10 yards and then they were sacked for four yards. And, um, I'm not going to know what you're talking about, but a person who knows football is going to be able to follow it and answer the question. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to answer it. I might know how to do the math, but I don't understand the context. Mm -hmm. And at this bias committee, I had an attorney who thought basically every item had bias in it, including items that had no context at all. <laughs> it made for a very challenging week um, to try Dude. to get through all the items because he wanted, he was, you know, saying there was bias in every single item, but mm -hmm. he really didn't understand what it was. Okay, so who helped motivate or inspire you the most in following your dreams? Um, this is going to sound weird, but I'm going to say probably Bob Barker because um, for a while, for six years, I did a live TV show after school where we helped students with their homework. And so having seen how he hosted The Price is Right kind of helped guide me in helping to, or in hosting that show and helping students and making sure that, you know, everyone was having a good time and, and no one felt like you know, they were being pressured or anything. Mm -hmm. So what message do you want to tell children all over the world about being a mathematics session specialist? Hmm. I don't know. It's just, it's a really great job. It's obviously been real challenging the last couple of years with the pandemic um, because we haven't really been able to give as many tests because students just haven't been you know, in school as much. They've been doing a lot of homeschooling or, I guess, remote learning. So. Mm -hmm. so what part of your job would you say is the most enjoyable to do? Um, I think I really like building the test forms the most because you get to kind of take everything that you've done and put it all together and try to match, um, you know, the blueprint, which is what kinds of items should go on a test. Um, I just kind of like that the most because it's kind of like putting together a puzzle, which I also really like. So when you were a kid, what did you want to do when you grew up? Did you always know that you were going to be in mathematics? Uh, when I was very young, I, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. And then as I got older and kind of got more 
um, comfortable with math and kind of that became my favorite subject, then I really wanted to just be a math teacher. And so I did that for 13 years and then decided to try a career change. Okay. If you could go back 10 years and tell yourself something, what would it be? Let's see. So 10 years ago is 2012. Mm -hmm. Um... I think I would probably tell myself that I was going to stay at my job for another 10 years because this is the longest I've actually worked anywhere. And I just celebrated my 11th year in okay. February. So what was the first job that you ever had? Uh, my first job was... Um, I don't even know if this counts, but I guess technically it was my first job. So I worked for a very short time at a Marie Callender's restaurant as a dishwasher. Okay. So was there anything you learned from that job that helped you to be a better mathematics assessment specialist? Uh, from that job, no. <laughs> Other than don't do something you don't like. Mm -hmm. Now, my dad said that they made a movie about you on Netflix. Can you tell me about that? Sure. So a... Um, Someone who create, who writes or directs documentaries contacted me back in uh, around 2010, 2011, because they had done an article about the perfect showcase bid in um, Esquire magazine, and his parents had got him a copy of it. And so he let me know that he was thinking about doing a movie loosely based on the story, and that, um, you know, the, I would have a paid credit position or something. And a few years would go by and he'd contact me again. A few years would go by and he'd contact me again. And in 2017, he said, I've got the funding. I'm ready to do this. Can you send me a <clears throat> description of what happened? And so I sent him a, kind of a whole story. And he changed his mind from doing the loosely based movie, you know, based on the story and said it was just going to be a documentary about me. And so we filmed... Okay. Three days in 2017, he filmed some additional footage with other folks, and then it came out in 2018. Wow. So what do you do for fun? Um, I do have a large collection of um, peanuts, um, memorabilia. So I have a lot of Snoopies and stuff like that. So I do like going places to look for things that are not already in my collection. Okay. So, I know you made a video, but do you play video games? And what's your favorite one? Um, yes, I do. The one that I... I don't know if it counts as a video game, per se, but it's uh, it's Nonograms, where it's kind of a... Um, it tells you how many squares are going to be black in a row <clears throat> and how many squares... Like, you'll have to skip squares, and then there'll be another number. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Um, but I do like those because they kind of have to make you think a little bit. Okay. So what is your favorite book to read? Um, I'm not a whole lot. I don't do a whole lot of reading, so I don't know about that. Okay. I do like going back and reading some of the old Peanuts comics. I know that's not really a book, but. Okay. Okay. Now, can you tell me that one story? You know, remember, this is a kid show. But that one story, well... That you're not supposed to tell me about. Come on, you can tell me. Um. So, the Price is Right, from what I have heard, um, I was told through someone who heard from someone who works on the show that there is a short list of names that if any of those people show up, that the pages are supposed to notify security immediately. Oh. And my name is on that list, or so I've heard. Uh, during the Why? filming of the documentary, the um, the company that owns the show told the filmmaker that he could not mention that in the documentary because they don't have a band list and there's no one's banned and I can come back whenever I want. So allegedly according to them i could go back to the show but that's one of those things where i don't think i want to invest the time and money to go to just find out that i'm not going to be allowed in the studio yeah well do you have a website or facebook for my listeners someone to follow you 
Um, I do have Facebook. Uh, it's just my first and last name, Ted Slauson. Okay. What is the one question that you think I forgot to ask you? I don't know. You've asked me a lot of questions. I don't think you've forgotten anything. Okay. Well, thank you, Ted, for being my special guest. Can you stick around for Math Corners? I sure can. Tiberius's favorite subject, it's Math Corners! Thank you, Ted, for helping me with Math Corners. This week, we're going to do some more multi-step word problems. You know my dad loves showing me how math can be used in the real world. Today, we're going to talk about pizza. Everyone loves pizza. Here we go. Sean invites his friends over for a pizza and a movie. He makes a small cheese pizza for himself and a large pepperoni pizza for his friends. They're going to watch the movie for two hours. Sean uses 0.75 pounds of dough for the cheese pizza and twice as much dough for the pepperoni pizza. How much dough does Sean use in all? So this is a real world situation because people do love to eat pizza and watch movies. So let's get started. So we know that the small pizza uses 0.75 pounds of dough, and the second pizza is twice as big as 2 times 0.75, and is 1.5 pounds. Now that's a big pizza. Now I have those two hours, but I know my dad, he loves to throw stuff in that we don't need. So we're just going to skip that. Now we add the pounds of both pizzas. So 1.5 plus 0.75 is 2.25 pounds. And that is the total amount of dough that Sean used. Ted, as an expert of accessing mathematics, do you have any advice on how to improve my math corner segment? I do not. That was actually a good item. I could probably take that scenario and write uh, three or four good questions about it. Okay. So, Ted, my teacher said that I would use math every day. What is the best way to show kids that they will always use math in the world? I think because everyone will get a bank account at some point and have to make sure that they have money to pay all their bills. Okay. Um, so they're going to have to learn how to um, kind of keep track of what they're spending and what they're making. Okay. Thank you so much, Ted, for your help with Math Corners. Absolutely. So you want to make an ad for your company, right? Yeah, Tiberius. You want to help me? Okay, so what's the name of the company? PPWND. PP what? Professional Pressure Washing and Detailing. So you like clean driveways? Yeah, like that. We pressure wash commercial buildings and semi-truck and trailers. So how would someone get a hold of you? Uh, they can visit my site at ppwnd.com or call me at 407-900-7793. So I just tell them to call you at 407-900-7793 or visit PP. WND.com? Yeah, Tiberius, you got it. Cut, that's a wrap. Just use that. And now it's time for the Heart of a Lion. As you know, we talk about the qualities of living by the Heart of a Lion, which stands for leadership, integrity, obedience, and nobility. This week, we're going to talk about obedience. For me, I think obedience is being fully committed to doing what is pleasing to God. The qualities of obedience are compliance with a good attitude and respect for the laws. You know when someone is obedient when they follow instructions willingly and thoroughly. Well, as you know, this is now my favorite virtue. This week, my dad had a cough and told me that I had to stay away from him. He could still help me with my homework and so forth, but he would not get close to me or give me hugs. This was not fun, but he did not want to get me sick during the school season. I like getting hugs and getting help on things, but he just helped me from farther away. But I have followed obedience and kept my distance. I also do not complain about it because I know that that would make him feel bad. So, Ted, do you see or use obedience at all this week? I think the way I use obedience is in the way I drive. I always try to follow all the rules of the road. I try to use my turn signals to let other drivers know what I'm doing. Um, I think that's kind of the biggest thing for me. Of all of the Heart of the Lion virtues, which virtue do you see the most? Um, probably in my line of work, I think I see leadership the most. Okay. Well, we should always try and be land strong in everything we do, shouldn't we? Sure. The Tribeer Show would like to thank Boggy Creek Game Adventures for 
being one of our sponsors. I got to go on an air belt and saw a real gator. I even got to go to the gem mine and mine for some gems. We ate a steak dinner at the restaurant and even got some gator rights. If you want to have a blast with the entire family, I suggest you go to www.bcairboats.com right now to get your tickets today. The website again is bcairboats.com. And that's our show, folks. I want to thank the one, the only, the amazing Ted Lawson for being on my show. It has been so much fun talking with you today. I think we learned a lot about being a mathematics assessment specialist and the price is right. Well, thank you again for having me on your show. I had a great time. No problem. Do you mind giving your website? Uh, yes, my Facebook is Ted Lawson. Okay. Also, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at The Tiberius Show. And please be sure to visit The Tiberius Show on YouTube and like and subscribe. Also, be sure to listen to us next week on The Tiberius Show with your host, Tiberius Boy!